morning to you all. Wherever you are watching this from, I am so glad you could join us. Uh, in case you are wondering, my name is James. I'm the minister at Holy Trinity Church in Nailsey. I hope you've had a good week. Um, one highlight for me was our virtual church prayer meeting, uh, which was Wednesday evening, when loads of us piled onto Zoom, and it was lovely to see lots of familiar faces on my computer screen. It is wonderful that the coronavirus isn't stopping us worshipping and praying together. Obviously, we'd love to be in the same room as each other on Sundays, and the reality is that we don't know when that's going to be. Uh, the Prime Minister is going to set out some plans today, but the House of Bishops met earlier this week and laid out a three-phase strategy for churches. So, uh, phase one is when uh, ministers will be allowed back in buildings, church buildings, um, because at the moment I'm not meant to go in the church building. Uh, phase two um, is about the church being open for certain ceremonies, um, for funerals, weddings, that sort of thing. And phase three will be when congregations can start meeting again. Uh, but even then, it's going to be quite restricted, probably social distancing, uh, limited numbers, and maybe not even singing. We're not sure. We don't know a lot, to be honest, but that's the rough plan at the moment. I think it's fair to say it'll be a long haul before we get back to normal services. But we are where we are, and the Lord is always with us, however or wherever we worship. So... Just before we led in a song by Kevin and Kim, let's pause and then pray. Our great and loving Father, at times like this, we do feel a bit more fragile and vulnerable than perhaps we used to. Lost some of our security, don't feel as strong as we did, incapable. But what a reassurance it is to know that we have a good and powerful God by our side. So we come before you this morning. We come eager to worship. We come keen to bring our prayers before you. We come hungry to learn from you. Please would you bless us as we seek to be a blessing to you in our worship this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello Church Fam, good morning. It's lovely to be able to with, be with you this morning to worship. Uh, we're going to be singing Great Are You Lord. Uh, it's one that some of you may know um, and some of you may not know. So if you do know then please do sing along. And if you don't then just feel free to reflect upon the words. Let us worship together.
Hello everyone, my name's Ruth Jolly and it's a tremendous privilege and a joy to be with you all again today as we come to somewhere in the region of the 50th day of lockdown and as our hair grows longer and our tempers grow shorter we turn to Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, the one who knows the end from the beginning, the one who understands what's really going on. We turn to him. Today we have the fourth in our series of the seven I am sayings of Jesus as recorded in John's Gospel. John was a man who liked patterns and gave significance to numbers. He recorded seven I am sayings and seven signs that Jesus performed because seven was the Jewish number for perfection. So there's a background theme of Jesus being the perfect man. And of course, I am was also the name of God. And so there's another background theme of Jesus, who is God. As he said himself, I and the Father are one. So far, we've reflected on Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate. And today we have one of his best known and most evocative sayings, I am the good shepherd. And that's why I've got Katie, my support sheep, with me today. I wonder what sort of picture it calls up for you when you hear, I am the good shepherd. Maybe you think of sheepdog trials. Maybe your mind moves to driving along a Lakeland road when sheep without a shepherd just keep wandering randomly into the path of your car. Maybe it brings up for you a well-known hymn or worship song. I can't hear those words, I am the Good Shepherd, without thinking of a text card I was given in Sunday school when I was very small. It was a picture card with the Bible verse on it, and it showed a highly improbable Jesus with a long blonde hair and a blonde beard, dressed in a white robe, and with a group of very sentimental looking sheep around his feet. I think maybe the artist was thinking of the Good Shepherd in Psalm 23, who leads the sheep beside the still waters. There was certainly no danger that they were passing through the valley of the shadow of death. But what was it really like to be a shepherd in the time of Jesus? Was it all wandering along in the sunshine with a sweet smile on your face? In that case, who really needs a shepherd? Mary's going to read to us from John's Gospel, chapter 10, a chapter which makes it quite clear that all was not just sweetness and light for the sheep. This morning's reading is from John, chapter 10, verses 1 to 5 and 11 to 15. The Good Shepherd and His Flock I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls out his sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The verses that Robin spoke to us about last week come in the middle of the passage that we've just heard read. And in them, Jesus said that he himself was the gate, the way in and out of God's sheepfold. And Robin pointed out that whereas the sheep are safe when they're in the fold, they do need to go out to get their nourishment. And so only through Jesus, who leads us in and out, do we find that fullness of life, which is ours, whatever state we find ourselves in. But today we look at the framework image in which that saying is encapsulated. And it talks about other teachers who claim to know the way to eternal life. And those other teachers actually included the very Pharisees to whom Jesus was talking when he said this. And he said that those other teachers were thieves and robbers because they climbed over the wall in order to bypass the gate. But the one who enters by the gate, the one who in a very real sense is the gate, is the true shepherd of the sheep, says Jesus. He knows each one by name. He cares for each of them with a deep sacrificial care. He is not in it in any sense for what he can get out of it. He's not in it for the money or the fame or the adulation. He knows that the sheep cannot save themselves. Ultimately, he will go to any lengths to keep them safe. He is prepared to die for them. Now, the people listening to Jesus had a double advantage. First of all, they knew about shepherds and sheep. They'd observed them and lived with them all their lives. They knew what sheep did. They knew, for example, that the shepherd gave each of his sheep a name and that if he called that sheep's name, the sheep would recognise his voice and would follow him. We're accustomed to a model where the shepherd calls the sheepdog who recognises his voice and rounds up the sheep. The system Jesus knew was similar in a way, but it cut out the middleman. But his listeners had another advantage. They knew their scriptures, our Old Testament, through and through. They'd heard it read week after week, and they knew great chunks of it off by heart. And so when they heard Jesus talk about the Good Shepherd, they would immediately have thought of Psalm 23 with its pictures of still waters and restoring of the soul, but also of the valley of the shadow of death, where we fear no evil, because he is with us. And when Jesus talked about the bad shepherds, they would immediately have made the link to Jeremiah chapter 23, where it says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture. They'd have thought of that and they'd have made the connection. And when he mentioned calling each sheep by name, they would have heard an echo of Isaiah chapter 43. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. Calling by name is powerful. It creates intimacy and relationship. Almighty God, creator of the universe, who holds all things in his powerful hand, cares about me personally, cares enough to speak to me, directly. I can recall just one time in my life when I felt God called me by name. We'd been going through a very difficult time and I was questioning whether God could really love me and we were in a big worship session and we were singing about Christ dying on the cross and all of a sudden it was as though up over the auditorium, I could see the cross of Christ lifted up and he was on the cross and he was looking down at me and he just said, I did it for you, Ruth. 
calling by name is significant in our lives. It's also very significant in John's Gospel as a whole. Think of Philip at the Last Supper, Mary Magdalene in the Resurrection Garden, and Simon Peter on the seashore. Each of them is addressed by name at a highly significant moment in their life. Think of Lazarus in the very next chapter of John's Gospel to the one we've just been reading. Lazarus was called by name. He was called out of the grave by name. The person who is called by name looks into the eyes of Jesus and is challenged or consoled. For Lazarus, it was a return to life. For Mary, a deeply comforting moment when she realised that Jesus was not dead after all. For Simon Peter on the seashore, it was both restoring and challenging. And have you ever thought about the special words that Jesus spoke to him three times? Feed my sheep. As the role of the Good Shepherd, to some extent, was passed on to the Church, the body of Christ on earth. So the Good Shepherd knows each of his sheep intimately and individually, and they follow him when they hear his voice, because they trust him. Instead of rounding them up and driving them, he leads them and they follow. This means that in every circumstance of life, Jesus goes ahead of us and is in it with us. In fact, it's even better than that. In Psalm 139, the psalmist says of God, you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. However dark and threatening the storm that rages around, Jesus is ahead of us, leading the way. He's behind us, watching our back. He's walking alongside, laying a hand on our shoulder and saying, fear not, for I am with you. I wonder... What are the waters in your life which threaten to overwhelm you? I wonder what are the fears and dangers which snap around your ankles like wolves? There may be nothing to do directly with the lockdown. You may have concerns, fears, challenges in your life which are not in any way directly related to COVID-19, but they loom all the larger because of the strangeness of our circumstances. You may have financial worries, you may have family worries, you may quite simply be afraid of death in this time when death seems to be all around us. If that's you, to you God says, I call you by name, and you are mine. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. I walk ahead of you. I walk behind you. I walk alongside you. I take your hand. I care about you to the uttermost. To each of us in our deepest need, Jesus says these things. He has gone ahead of us, even through death. He has conquered death. We follow him. We don't be afraid for he has redeemed us. He has called us by name and we are his. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, great shepherd of the sheep, we thank you that you did not leave us to flounder, that you came and walked among us and experienced every danger, every fear and every joy of this life that we live. We thank you that in your great love you went to death and out the other side for us. We thank you 
that you call us by name and we are yours. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Morning, Morning everyone. everyone. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, so we can reflect on all that we've heard this morning. We're now going to sing, The Lord's My Shepherd. I will trust in you alone. Hello and welcome to my study. I'm Kevin Royal, one of the retired ministers attached to Holy Trinity. It's a real privilege this morning for me to be able to lead the whole church in prayer together. Before we pray, let's just remind ourselves that this is about communicating with God, a God who cares about each and every one of us 
and we can talk to him and we can listen to him and we can pray to him. I'm going to read part of Psalm 86 just to set the context of our praying. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble I will call to you, for you will answer me. Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvellous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your ways, O Lord and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart, and I will fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. That is a faithful God who we turn to in our prayers now. Let's pray. The resurrection power of Jesus is at work in his church and in his people. And during this time, many people are volunteering to help in the pandemic. Let's pray for them, especially those working in our local community. Loving Father, we thank you for the COVID-19 group in Nailsea and we pray for all the volunteers who are involved in working with our local community and helping those who are housebound. We pray that you will sustain them, protect them and enable them to do their job of distributing food medicines and encouragement to all who are in need. Hear us, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. And now let's pray for those around us in our own community. Maybe your next door neighbours, maybe your friends and family, maybe some people you know who are particularly sick or in need of help. Perhaps name them in a time of quiet that I'm going to leave now and then I'll say another prayer. Loving Saviour, we thank you that you care about each individual. as we imagine the people that we've been thinking about in our mind's eye. We see you, Jesus, standing alongside them, the one who stretched out his hand to heal the sick, to raise up those who were downcast. Restore them, we pray. May they know the restoring power of your Holy Spirit to renew them in health, in strength and in courage in these times of trial. Hear us, O Lord, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And let us pray now for our national leaders in this time of difficulty. We think of our Queen, we think of our Prime Minister, members of government, those involved in organising things in our health service, in our care homes and in our local communities. Lord God and loving Father, we pray for our national leaders and especially for our Prime Minister Boris Johnson May he have learnt 
through his time of having been in hospital. More of your love for him and of your power to enable him to do the task to which he is called of leading our country through this time of testing to a new normal in the future. May he have the wisdom to know what that should be, the courage to speak it out and the ability to implement it in accordance with your perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray too, O Lord, for all those who have to make decisions that will affect the lives of many of us, whether through the health service, or through education, or transport, or in other, any other major areas of the life of this nation. May they have wisdom, may they have courage, may they be able to fulfil their roles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Let us unite our prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. As Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. So, we've come to the end of our time together this Sunday. But what a wonderful scripture to take with us into this coming week that we have a good shepherd who even laid down his life to save us, his sheep. Um, hopefully that will be such an encouragement to us, whatever our week looks like. And um, here's some words from the last chapter of Hebrews to send us out to serve our good shepherd this week. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. Equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you this week. Same time, same place next week. Until then, goodbye.